Hi, everyone. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, thank you to Peter and thank you to Shiva. Uh, it's one of his sort of radical ideas to bring in a historian to speak about these current events. So you, I want you to bear with me because the story I'm going to sort of tell you today is about the history of environment and balance sheets and how can we get environmental um, and natural resource measures onto balance sheets. I have to say, historically, it's really very, very challenging. And I think that it's important that current practitioners and, and people who are trying to achieve this realize sort of what's happened in the past and what the challenges are. Um, my work uh, has been on the history of accounting and the history of accountability. I'm working on a new book on the history of the balance sheet, believe it or not. So here I am, um, and I talked to Shiva about this, and that's probably why I'm here. My new book um, on a history of uh, the free market, or the idea of the free market, will be out in five weeks. It also touches on these ideas. Balance sheets. Um, to many of you, it might seem kind of semi-simple or modern. It's really, really old. Um, obviously, accounting goes back thousands of years, but balance sheets and double entry balance sheets really go back to the late 1200s in Tuscany. Um, and it, there, we have many forms of balance sheets. I'm just showing you some sort of ancient uh, balance sheets. And it has been a very long and strange struggle to get things onto balance sheets. And I want to talk to you about that today. But the first thing I do want to say is that essentially um, the history of accounting, which we associate with Italy, actually I think has a more sort of dynamic chapter in the history of Holland. And the reason I want to bring that up today um, is because Holland shows that there's actually an environmental history of accounting. And the Dutch Republic, sort of between 1580 and let's say the mid 1800s, so 1760 or so, the Dutch Republic, which is per capita probably the richest place and the most productive place in the world for about 130 years, it becomes an, a society focused on accounting. And one of the reasons is environmental. And so the entire Dutch society becomes fluent in double entry accounting. They become aware of a, a balance sheet. So if I want you to imagine a society where everyone knows what a balance sheet is and almost everyone from the, the leader, from the prince to people in the street can actually audit and do books. That seems completely crazy now, um, but it was the case in the Dutch Republic. Uh, the Dutch Republic, as today is a country built, well, it's not no longer a republic, it's a monarchy for those of us who find that a little hard to swallow after all the battles fought to keep the, the, the Dutch Republic politically free. Um, it was a country, and it is a country, which is mostly or at least around 50% below sea level. Um, and one of the reasons that this society privileged and focused on accounting so much was because of the fact that it had to essentially take the country from the water. And to do that, and you'll see in this image, this long Dutch history of floods and dealing with water, it actually goes back to about 1150 uh, when the Dutch start coming up with a windmill technology to keep water out. And there's an old Dutch saying, whom water harms stops the water. So what one has in, in Dutch society um, are these, these kind of um, community-based associations to build pumps and windmills to drain the land, to bring land out of the water. This means that the people who do it are free because they're not subject to a feudal lord. Um, it means they believe that God and technology and management have given them land. And what allows these associations to work is essentially community accounting. So what you have is a country that has to build technology to survive and to maintain itself. And this is in the early Middle Ages that this begins. And in order for that to work, they have to have good management. If management fails, they die. 
Um, and therefore, they maintain remarkable accounting literacy and and remarkable and re- remarkable awareness of management accounting in their society. Um, here is a sort of picture of how the Dutch polders work. Now, there's something else. At the same time, the Dutch are also creating um, charitable organizations. And these charitable organizations are run the same way, often by the same people, often in the same spaces. They might be schools, they might be prisons, they might be um, uh, they might be monasteries. Uh, and what happens is men and women will manage these associations and they will do so with account books for hundreds of years in Holland. We see a general literacy in double entry bookkeeping, so of real balance sheets in Holland, starting around the 15, the early 1500s. That's incredibly early, okay, for, for to have a general awareness of this accounting. What then happens in Holland is that it just enters, it permeates all parts of society. So artists will give renditions of things using allegories from accounting, like balances. Um, wealthy merchants will portray themselves with their account books and showing themselves to be expert in the technologies of keeping balance sheets and ledgers and via double entry bookkeeping. I if any of you have read my work or seen me speak before, you might have seen these images. It's just sort of remarkable that over hundreds of years in Holland, we get a society in which the finest artists, you have to understand that to create a sort of masterwork of painting, like this portrait of the merchant, which is in the Met in New York City, this is the equivalent of a large budget film. Uh, and again, much more lasting, and as far as I'm concerned, much more meaningful. So the the kind of energy and resources that go into these paintings are massive. They're found in churches. They're found in in the charitable and public administrative institutions. When I talk about paintings, if one goes to Brussels and goes to the Fine Arts Museum, one can see many of them, or, or in Bruges, I'm talking about many, many paintings with different themes. Some think, for example, that this image is anti-Semitic. It might be, it's also a Christian image where part of the strap of the account book looks like a serpent. The Dutch not only talk about keeping good accounts, but this is important for what I'm going to get to with sustainability and the environment. They talk about the dangers of having too much faith in accounting and not being aware that if accounting is not done well or faithfully, it can lead to existential spiritual failure. And so the Dutch had a sense that bad accounting could lead to absolute downfall, or even in this slide, which is my favorite, it could lead to madness. And I do think that today we're sort of in that state um, where, at least in the United States, huge swaths of the population are in some sort of massive climate denial. I mean, or practical denial, like I am here surrounded by technological advices, uh, 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 devices. I spent the morning doing things and I noticed that every 10 minutes I was disposing of a piece of plastic. It's just crazy. It's not sustainable. Um, and somehow that plastic is not accounted for. And it, it's kind of crazy. If you actually wanted to account that plastic in to a cost accounting, it would be absolutely nuts. And that's just for me and my house and the American mounds of plastic that I produce. So this picture of people, this is probably the finest rendition of double entry accounting we have as far as the actual imagery goes, the quality of the books that you see here. Um, And yet the people in the painting have gone mad. Uh, And this is uh, The Two Tax Gatherers by Marinus van Remersvela. Um, They've actually gone mad because they're accounting is either bad or they have put too much faith in it and not enough concern about their own fallibility. I want you to think about a society that not only thinks about accounting, but it thinks thinks about it in an existential way, publicly with philosophers and artists and leaders, and then people in normal civil society, but also worry about what accounting can actually do to someone emotionally and spiritually. I mean, it's literally staggering, okay? Um, This uh, painting is another one of my favorites. It depicts uh, a rich merchant who cannot balance his books 
because the person who owes him money is dead and because he has not taken into account death. And therefore, it's prideful to think one can manage things completely. But it also shows the risk of what can go on or off a book. And death is the one who here balances the books. It's absolutely remarkable painting. Um, Now, one of the things that's very important to realize in Holland is that um, account, good accounting and balance sheets, while they actually never fully achieve having uh, state ledgers that are in double entry in a systematic way, they do try. And so this uh, uh, person, Simon Stevin, is, um, is one of the great leaders of the Dutch Republic. He's from a common background. He was a humanist. He was a scientist. He was a proto-physicist. He was a Latinist. He was a translator. And he was an accounting expert. And I will say, I found that societies that manage to do good accounting usually have remarkable le- levels of literacy of all kinds. Um, literacy, um, financial literacy, uh, literary literacy, scientific literacy, and that have theologies that are remarkably sophisticated and not simplistic, <laughs> which means there's a lot of reading and sophistication that goes into religious life as well into ev- as every other part of life. It seems that literacy really helps humans. I know that might sound surprising these days, but we're finding that almost nobody reads books. Um, it's a little scary. And reading books is actually part of accounting. Um, Stevan creates a manual that says princes themselves must be able to audit books. That is a remarkable statement, one that has rarely been applied, but it probably hasn't changed. And at the moment he's doing this, the first publicly traded um, company emerges. It's not the first colonial company, but it becomes the biggest, the richest, and the most powerful, the Dutch East India Company, um, the VOC. Um, This emerges in 1602. And in the same year, we get the emergence of the first stock exchange. Uh, I and others have hypothesized that this stock exchange exists because there is so much confidence in Dutch society and so much confidence in the books of Dutch companies. Um, Now, there's also some confidence in the Dutch East India um, Company's books. However, after about 20 years, they start cooking the books. And this is, of course, very typical. Uh, A massive, one of the first uh, uh, multinational, super colonial, planetary companies. And within 20 years, they're cooking the books. They're doing insider trading. Um, they're they're doing every sort of possible financial crime one can imagine. And so there's a stockholders revolt in 1622. I call this the Dutch audit. Um, some some of the shareholders are themselves sort of criminal pirates, but others are legitimate, and they ask for a reckoning, and they get it. And this I think is really important because it shows. And Shiva, I know, is very attached to the the Freedmenian belief in in the goodness of shareholders. I not so much, but this is an interesting and I think important example of the first shareholders' revolt of the first shareholders sort of ever calling for an audit. And part of this actually was a question of what would go on to the company's balance sheet and who could do such an audit. And what I think is fascinating here is they all come to the conclusion that Prince Morris of Nassau, the head of state, should do the audit. And it just so happens that he was best friends in university with at university with Stevan, the commoner, who taught him how to do double entry. Again, these are these kind of things in history which will probably never happen again. I want you to imagine for a moment an American president or a, a British prime minister sitting at Oxford with a commoner who didn't go to Eton <laughs> or Winchester or Harrow, sitting with a commoner who teaches them accounting. Uh, I just, I don't know, I'm a little skeptical that this will happen again. Maybe some other form will happen. Prince Morris was literate in accounting, and we find this out um, in uh, uh, just recently when some colleagues found his ledgers and found that while he didn't write them, he annotated them and was able to audit them. He audits the books of the Dutch East India Company. It's the state that has to do it. It's the state that actually has to come in, not only maintaining a standard, but that that actually is trusted by the public because 
Prince Morris says, look, I can't publish the audit. There's too much state military and economic information. You will have to trust me. And the shareholders do. The Dutch East India Company goes on to bring 18% returns for well over 100 years, huge chunks of them from a mastery of trading, um, uh, international um, shipping, and slavery, which is where the big money uh, was and where it often is, is in um, exploited labor. And, and in actually grabbing other people's natural resources, that's what the Dutch do. They don't so much as have an empire as what they do is they go to the Spanish and, and Portuguese empires and they set up comptoirs or counters where they get to the natural resources before the actual empire does and gets them to Amsterdam. So it's a kind of, it's a actually a sort of uh, natural resource pillaging model. Um, based also on slavery and based on remarkable financial and economic skill. None of this should sound surprising. They set the model for uh, many uh, international co companies now, and they're remarkably successful. Um, at the same time, what happens is what we see in Holland is that everyone then starts to portray their, inst their, their institutions wi with their double entry books open showing them auditing their own books and with their books open to the public saying, look, you can audit us. And I just want to show you these remarkable paintings. Can you imagine going to even one of the big three and having a picture of someone doing an audit in their, in their entrance hallway, like a massive painting? <laughs> I mean, sorry, no, of course you can't. If you go on the big three's websites, you will find almost no mention of accounting. Um, they don't really like to talk about it as a kind of philosophical or meaningful uh, uh, practice, which I find really staggering uh, and quite troublesome, to be honest. For them and for us, we'll see how long it is big three. Um, I also want to show uh, the literacy. Probably there were more women involved in high-level accounting in 17th century Holland than there are today in the big three. Um, there are still massive issues with who gets to account and who has the authority of accounting and how that authority is used and, of course, what goes on balance sheets. Now, I, I want to jump now quickly to the moment that essentially England becomes the accounting center. It looks at Holland and there's this huge uh, movement of emulation of Dutch uh, uh, liter accounting literacy. And what happens is, is really starting in about 1706, I trace the rise of English accounting literacy and mastery. Um, and essentially, um, what happens is, is this guy, William Petty, essentially is, this guy is, a, a, he's an economist, not an accountant. But what he does is he puts uh, people's labor, trees, um, lakes, all these things, what we would call political arithmetic, he counts up the wealth of a country and puts it onto a national balance sheet. He figures out that per capita, the British are actually, um, or the English still in this case, are more productive than the French. So he creates this national balance sheet. But what I want to point out today is that this thing, which is seen as part of the creation of modern economics, never really translates into the practices of accounting. And we don't see this kind of uh, national accounting, which actually goes back to the 16th century when the French start counting every church and every, try and count every cow in their country and every hillside and their mineral deposits, their mineral deposits as a kind of national balance sheet. So Petty does this national balance sheet in a sophisticated way, and yet it does not end up having an effect on uh, the profession of accounting. It's only in the 18th century that we get a more sophisticated kind of cost accounting. Josiah Wedgwood does that, where he starts accounting for time, labor, space, laziness, loss. But we still, even with colonialism, even with the massive companies of the modern age, we still don't get in the profession of accounting the kind of balance sheets that we actually get in early modern economics. My new book discusses the differences between um, accounting and economics, and that's so problematic. Um, and I'm startled that if in the 16th and 17th centuries, major economists and thinkers 
we're putting natural resources onto balance sheets. It startles me that we don't do that today in private industry, for example, to the level that we should really at all, um, as I think is shown from just the use of plastics in my house. Um, where does this leave us? Um, I believe the accounting industry is, and I, I guess I'll say this now, it's just not where it should be. It does not have the sophistication, the cultural, political, or intellectual clout to insist on this or really influence things. So who is going to have these balance sheets changed? That is a question that I leave to you. And given these historical challenges, I wonder if you, this might give you ideas about how we can create new, modern, sustainable, or sustainably oriented balance sheets. Um, I have some ideas from history, but they seem very, very hard to do. Um, and once again, I think they go back to literacy. And that is a challenge right now as well. So I guess I leave you with a lot of questions um, and some concern and pessimism, but I do see ways forward. So, um, and, and I do think going back to history is incredibly useful. So I'm grateful to be here today and thank you so much uh, for having me.